Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the most emotionally overwhelming episode for me on Step Up with Natasha so far. Um, the, this episode is very special to me. The guest that I have tonight is a very special man. He's someone who not only forgave the man who killed his only son, but also advocated for his release from the prison and offered him a chance of redemption by offering to work with him. He has taken this upon himself and has made his mission to teach the art of forgiveness, especially to the kids around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm highly, highly, highly honored to have this man, Mr. Azim Kamisa, on my show tonight. And I can't, I can't contain my excitement right now. Uh, Mr. Kamisa, a very warm welcome. And I know that we have had a chat before as well last week, but I have to tell you that I was really looking forward to this conversation again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for honoring me with this conversation. Thank you. You're very welcome, Natasha, and thanks for having me on your show. Okay, so for starters, Mr. Kamiza, um, because I, when I was watching your videos on YouTube, and what I realized was that whenever you went on the stage or whenever there's an interview happening, it was you only who was sharing that story, right? Like you have to go through that story over and over again. And I want to know that, you know, when you took up this cause and when you realized that I have to share the stories to stop people from opting, you know, violence, you knew it somewhere that this is how it's going to be. You will have to go through the whole process over and over again. And this is how it will be addressed that your son was killed. So didn't it hurt that point of time or doesn't it hurt today? Like, where do you get that courage to deal with this? You know, you have to relive the the incident, and obviously uh, reliving the incident uh, is painful. Uh, however, um, what I have learned in my 25 years is that, yes, it's like taking the scab off the wound, and most all of us have experienced how painful sometimes that can be, but the benefit from it is when the scab reforms, it is a little smaller than the one you took off. So there is a healing in sharing this story. Uh, I'm reminded uh, of Confucius, who said that uh, shared sorrow is half sorrow, shared happiness is double happiness. So part of the grieving process, uh, and I do teach this uh, in my two-day forgiveness workshop, which actually I'm doing one at the end of uh, next month, September. Uh, I used to do it in person, but obviously with the pandemic, I'm now doing it uh, uh, on uh, online. Um, uh, it is essentially train the trainer. And most uh, th uh, therapists and people that work with victims, social workers, and even ordinary people that are dealing with trauma, tragedy, uh, there's a lot of angst in life. You know, we all have losses. Uh, half the marriages uh, in America, at least, end up in divorce, financial hardships uh, through a pandemic. Uh, that forgiveness is a tool we can all, all uh, use. And part of the workshop is in learning how to grieve. Because that's the first step, is you have to grieve. And grieving is painful, but it is medicine. There's a good... Turkish adage that says, he who conceals his grief does not find a remedy for it. And one of the healthy ways to grieve is to share, is to share uh, your predicament, your tragedy, your, your pain, because in that sharing, there is healing. Obviously, there are many other ways that are healthy ways to grieve prayer, meditation, spending time with nature, uh, reading something inspiring, um, uh, spending time with family and uh, close friends. Um, jour journaling was something that helped me a lot. But part of it is to share. So, you know, when I do share the story, I do relive those moments. Uh, and it's difficult because, you know, it's the worst nightmare any parent can have, losing a child. I mean, if I'd been at the site, 
you know, I would have very easily put my body between him and the bullet. So, yes, uh, it is, uh, but you know, pain is not a bad thing. Uh, as I've been doing this work for 25 years, I've had the honor to meet many enlightened human beings in the world, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I met him now six times and, 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 and he always says that Pain is unavoidable. Suffering is avoidable because suffering is self-chosen. But um, uh, maybe the universe uh, gives us pain to help us evolve. Another great quote uh, by Rumi says that the light enters through the wound. So, you know, part of what I teach is that uh, uh, we don't like pain in our culture, you know, a slight headache and you want an extra strength Tylenol. Yeah, true. Problem with that is five hours later, you're gonna take another one. And another Rumi quote, the cure for pain is in the pain. So it's important to espouse pain because God, I believe, will never give you more pain than you can handle. Uh, and I see that there is a lot of growth in, in pain. In fact, it's good that you actually spoke about grieving because I was about to come to that, that uh, even you have mentioned it enough number of times, you've emphasized it enough that grieving, that's the first step towards your journey, uh, you know, on, uh, on this path of forgiveness. And that is also one of the most important ritual in your faith, which is like a 40 day grieving period, right? So uh, I, in fact, wanted to understand that what was that moment that transpired this whole thing where you realized that you know you really need to forgive was it that you set out an intention while in that grieving period or was it something that while that grieving period something happened and you know it was just aligned by the universe and things just started to fall in place and you were like yes i mean you know this is my calling that i have to forgive and i have to take this message even to more number of people so what what was that moment what was the whole process like that's a good question. Uh, the 40 day ritual was a very important part of me trying to navigate those early days. Uh, I was born a Sufi and I'm a practicing Sufi Muslim. And that 40 day uh, comes from my tradition. And uh, I was counseled by my spiritual teacher uh, that uh, according to our tradition, uh, that the 40 days after the passing of my son uh, was a time to grieve. You're not supposed to cook or clean home. Uh, you're just supposed to grieve. I had a lot of uh, support from my mosque where people brought me breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I had so much food because I lived by myself. Um, and I had to tell the story. And I couldn't even say Tariq, I couldn't say the word died because it was like a 2000 volt. But they were very patient. Um, and since Tariq died in such a tragic manner, um, he was a college student, worked as a pizza delivery man, a good kid, uh, um, great writer, great photographer, uh, kind hearted. His uh, hero was Gandhi, a man of peace. Uh, and he worked as a pizza delivery man and was lured to a bogus address. And in a gang initiation, we have a lot of problems in America with youth gangs. A uh, 14 year old shot and killed him. So, so Tariq's uh, uh, story was very tragic. And because it was tragic, I had to explain all the nuances of uh, how this tragedy happened which was hard. Uh, but looking back at it, uh, those 40 days uh, were important because uh, I remember meeting a father who'd also lost a son many years later. Uh, and he said to me, it took him 25 years to acknowledge that his son had been killed. Now, when you go through this 40 day grieving period, there is no denial. So looking back at it, as I said earlier, sure it was painful. It was like removing the scab on your, uh, on your wound, 
but there was a healing quality to it. And that support from the congregation was very meaningful because every hour or so we would chant, we would pray, we would meditate, we would read something inspiring, and then another group would show up and I'd have to go through the process. But the actual ritual is that the reason it is 40 days is that my son's soul was in the, in the company of his loved one and his family. And, 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 and that's the time uh, that was allocated according to our tradition to grieve. And there's a similar tradition in the Jewish faith called sitting Shiva, I believe it's 11 days. But after 40 days, the soul moves to a new consciousness. And of course, there was prayers at the funeral, 10 days, 20 days, 30 days, but the most significant prayers were on the 40 days. And that's when my spiritual advisor uh, counseled me and said, this ends the grieving period because now my son's soul moves to a different consciousness in preparation of its forward journey because we believe there's a journey after death. And he basically said to me that, you know, excessive grieving by family and loved ones after the 40 days would impede his journey in the new world. My recommendation to you is instead of grieving, if you do compassionate deeds in his name, that's like providing spiritual currency or high octane fuel so that he can, he can get uh, more, um, uh, you know, more support in, uh, in the next world and that high octane fuel can help him uh, go through the journey, whereas grieving uh, will impede it. And, that kind of stuck in my head. Um, and I uh, really didn't focus uh, on that very much till about April, Tariq died in January. And I was in, a, in April, I spent some time alone in the mountains. Uh, I have a good friend that has a, a condominium there. He says, gave me the keys, he says, use it as often as you want. And I spent um, about eight days uh, in the condo trying to figure out uh, how and why I would live the rest of my life because it was very difficult. I, I remember I was suicidal at one point. I really did not know how to move forward without him. He was a very important part of my life as children are. And I didn't uh, socialize. I uh, mostly ate at home and went out to dinner and I took long hikes in the mountain. Uh, and this thing played in my head as a broken record that good compassionate deeds done in the name of the departed are spiritual currency and provide high octane fuel. Whereas grieving, uh, impedes his journey. Of course, I didn't want to impede my son's journey. Uh, I wanted to, to do something to help him. And that's when it hit me that uh, what if I became the enemy of not of the person who killed my son, but the forces that led him and led many young men and women to fall through the crack and then get involved with gangs and drugs and alcohol and weapons. So that was the true enemy who wasn't the 14 years old. I saw that there were victims at both ends of the gun. And that I would create an organization named after him. It's called the Tari Kamisa Foundation to look at this problem of youth violence, which is a big problem in America. Uh, and we would do good compassionate deeds in his name because his name is on the marquee and we would create millions of dollars of spiritual currency so Tariq could finish his journey in the next world in a rocket. You know, that felt good because I'd lost all of my uh, willpower, my energy, and I worked as a, when he was alive, I worked in, in international finance or so routinely flew in from London, changed planes and flew to Tokyo. 
And I remember after Tariq died, it took all the willpower just to climb out of bed. But once I had that vision to do something uh, to create spiritual currency for him, that energy came back. Because obviously I wanted to do something for my son. You go on vacation, you buy a gift for your children before you buy anything for yourself. And, and, and how do you do something for your son who's no longer with you? Of course, my spiritual advisor had given me the, uh, the advice that creates spiritual currency in his name that would help him. So then as I came down from the mountain, so as to speak, uh, with fresh energy, uh, I had a job to do. And 25 years later, uh, it still gets me up in the morning because I know that talking to kids, which I now have given over a thousand presentations worldwide, over a million kids, teaching the principles of nonviolence, have over a hundred thousand letters, that I know in my heart I'm speaking with Tariq, I'm creating spiritual currency, and I feel he's soaring in the new world. So, you know, what I've learned uh, uh, in this journey, uh, Natasha, is that sometimes in deep tragedy or trauma, uh, there's a spark of clarity. The Tibetan Buddhists called that Obardo, which was the title of my first book, Azim's Bardo from Murder to Forgiveness, A Father's Journey. And in that gap is the clarity. Every saint has suffered the dark night of the soul. And the clarity in my tragedy was I saw that there were victims at both ends of the gap. It didn't come from my intellect or my loving heart because I don't think us mortals are capable of it. Rather, it was a download from a higher power. And I used to meditate an hour a day. I started uh, when I was 20 years old and I lost my son in my early 40s. So I had a fairly uh, strong spiritual foundation. Today, my practice is two hours a day. So that finally led me to forgive uh, my son's killer and invite his uh, grandfather and guardian to join me with the attitude that uh, we both lost a son because uh, Tony lived with his grandfather. Um, and when I met him, I told him I'm not here screaming resentment and revenge and anger. Rather, I'm here uh, I'm here in the spirit of empathy, compassion, and forgiveness because what I really see is we both lost a son. My son died and, and you lost your grandson, although it was like a son to him because he lived with his grandfather and calls him daddy. I can't bring my son from the dead. And there's nothing you can do to get Tony out of prison, it's out of your hand. He was the first 14 year old in the state of California to be tried as an adult. Um, and I started this foundation with the mission of stopping kids from killing kids by breaking the cycle of youth violence. And, uh, and, and the goal of the foundation first is to save lives of children because we lose so many on a daily basis. I still cry when I think of Sandy, Sandy Hook in Newtown, Connecticut, when 25, six-year-old first graders were gunned down in automatic machine gun fire in the richest nation in the world. I'm thinking, oh, this is crazy. So that was the first mandate is to save lives of children. The second was to empower the right choices so they don't fall to the crack and end up choosing lives of gangs and drugs and alcohol and weapons. And the third was to teach the principles of nonviolence of empathy, of accountability, of compassion, of forgiveness, of peacemaking, and peace building. Because, and I started with a very simple premise that violence is a learned behavior. No child is born violent. But if you accept that as a truism, then nonviolence can also be a learned behavior. But you have to teach it, because kids are not going to learn 
that through osmosis. And 25 years later, the foundation with the grace of God is successfully teaching it. And the grandfather and I are still together. And as you pointed out, Tony was recently released from prison after 24 years in November of last year. It was not, November of 2018 was his hearing where I was there advocating for his release. He was released in April of last year, 2019. And then he had to be in a halfway house through October of 2019. And then he moved with his grandfather and uh, is uh, now helping the foundation, uh, making sure others don't follow in his formal footstep. He's volunteering for the foundation, although I'd offered him a job, but he's selected to volunteer, much like I have for 25 years, and much like his grandfather has. He's training to be a plumber. He got his driver's license at 39, is how old he is now. In fact, his birthday is on September 22nd, he'll turn 40. Uh, and he's doing really well. I'm very proud of him. He's uh, got a full-time position with a company that supports the foundation and uh, hardworking. Uh, uh, he had two jobs. He used to do Monday through Friday, becoming a plumber. And on the weekend, he was working for a grocery store, which is now given up because the work is very hard. And uh, he's uh, helping with the foundation as a volunteer. So... In my hearts of hearts, I know we saved him, but more importantly, he will save many kids. Because often when he's, we just did a, a program together and when he tells the kids when he was 11, he joined the gang when he was 14, he killed my son. And he so wishes he could turn the clock back. How many 11 years old in the audience that are thinking about joining a gang will change their minds. I know that uh, uh, Tony will save many, many more lives. And I think that uh, uh, demonstrates uh, the power of forgiveness. Of course, I did not know all that has manifested in my life as a result of this choice I made 25 years ago, but uh, it was the right choice for me. And the way you have spoken about Tony right now, I mean, the kind of life he's leading right now, no, if no one knows about what he has been through, what he has done, no one can actually guess. I mean, I think it's a rebirth for him as well. Like, it's like Tony 2.0. It's, you know, he, he is also trying to cut off that past and try to be, I think, yes, he would be giving a, a lot of better future to many other students and kids, but even he has tried to carve out a better future for himself, which is commendable, I would say. Uh, but also going back to your grieving point, I really feel that when you talk, talked about grief, it is important, especially in the wake of this whole positivity movement, where you know we all the time are required to be happy, no matter whatever goes wrong, wherein we just keep on suppressing our feelings rather than actually getting in touch with the really raw emotions, wherein this whole grieving period gives you that time and space that you feel it, and you feel it so much, then, then it's easier for you to let go of it, right? So I think, you definitely acknowledge your own feelings, your loss in that grieving period. But what I wanted to know is that do you also acknowledge that honest and raw feelings that you would have felt for Tony for the first time? Did you also come face to face with those in the grieving period? Did you also acknowledge those feelings? But because I'm sure that forgiveness won't be the first reaction when you would have got to know that a 14 year old killed your son. What was your first reaction towards Tony? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Uh, when I first reached out to his grandfather, uh, in my meditation, I wanted to know how he was dealing with his tragedy. Um, it would be very difficult Maybe his journey was more difficult than mine because his grandson killed an innocent, unarmed human being. And he was the guardian. And I could feel his pain before I even met him. Um, I never saw, I never had anger towards Tony because I saw him as a victim. So I wasn't focused on Tony as much. Uh, 
there was a lot of media around this because uh, A was the first 14 year old to be tried as an adult. B, nine months later, I, I started the foundation and reached out to the grandfather. Uh, I was interviewed and they could see that I wasn't screaming revenge and retribution. That on the contrary, I had compassion and empathy for Tony, seeing him as a victim. I wasn't even uh, happy that he was tried as an adult. Uh, if, he had try, if he had tried as a juvenile, our laws would have released him before he was 25 years old. And of course, they changed the law. Uh, uh, you, can't, you can't do that anymore. It used to be 16. They lowered the age to 14 on January 1st, 1995. And this was the first time a 14-year-old was tried as an adult. And last year, in January, they put the age back to 16, which I was happy to see. So if it had happened uh, this year, uh, he would have been in juvenile court. So it was five years after that I actually went to see Tony. Now, that is hard to do to come eyeball to eyeball with the person who pulled the trigger on your child. And it took me many thousand hours of, of meditation. And my mother thought I was totally crazy and she's since passed, hopefully the good Lord. Uh, she didn't think that after I met him, but she thought I was crazy, but she was afraid of my my safety, and I said, don't worry about it. You know, Tony's not dangerous or anything like that. Uh, but I recognize that for me to complete my journey of forgiveness, that at some point I had to come eyeball to eyeball with Tony. Now, it was a little easier because I had known the grandfather for a good four years uh, and knew everything about Tony because we talked about Tony all the time. And then I finally told the grandfather, I'm ready to see Tony. Uh, and I'd like you to go with me because uh, this is our first meeting. But I need alone time with Tony because, he, you know, there are some holes in the story only he can complete. And with you there as his grandfather, you know, it's going to be difficult for him to be totally open. Uh, he may choose to be defensive. And I have some tough questions for him as well. I mean, he knew I'd forgiven him. He knew I'd started the foundation. He knew I'd been working with his grandfathers. And there was another gentleman who had helped me start the foundation, Mike Reynolds, who interviewed Tony 21 times between the time of murder and the trial, which was about two years later. Because it took him two years to figure out whether Tony should be tried as an adult or a juvenile. In those two years, Mike inter interviewed Tony 21 times and told Tony that the Camisa family, they're forgiven you. They're not about revenge and retribution. So he knew a lot about all of this anyway. Um, and I talked to him for an hour and a half, one-on-one, -on -one, man to man. He was 19 years old. And at one point in that meeting, in, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in 2000, uh, five years after the tragedy, uh, we locked eyeballs. I was sitting very close to him, like across a coffee table. And we held that glass for what seemed like a very long time. I'm looking in his eyes and he's looking in my eyes and we held that glance and I'm looking in his eyes trying to find a murderer. And I didn't. I was able to climb through his eyes and touch his humanity that I got the spark in him it was no different than the spark in you or anybody else who is listening or viewing this, this, uh, this interview. I, and I wasn't expecting that. And at that point, I told him, Tony, you know that I have forgiven you, but I want you to know that when you do come out, you have a job at the foundation, you can come and work with your grandfather and me. And 
as I left the prison a few hours later, I still remember, although it was you know, almost 20 years ago, uh, I remember that the stride that I walked out of the prison was a lot bouncier than the one I'd walked in with. And there was this like big albatross of weight that I'd released because I knew at that point that I had completed my journey of forgiveness. And the preeminent thought in my mind was, why did I wait five years? But then tell me I mean, I've written, I've, I've, I've written five books and in my, one of my books is called The Secrets of the Bulletproof Spirit, How to Bounce Back from Life's Hardest Hits. There's a chapter called Realize with Real Eyes. And that chapter was uh, inspired by my meeting Tony. And the next day, I got a call from um, the grandfather. And he said to me, he says, you know, that meeting you had with Tony has totally transformed him 180 degrees. And I said, you know, his name is Ples. I said, Ples, it was the same for me. Uh, he says, as you were leaving, Tony looked at me and says, Daddy, that's a very special man. I killed his one and only son. Not only has he forgiven me, he's offered me a job. I'm not worthy of his forgiveness and I'm not worthy of his job offer. But I'm going to try. And, and the grandfather says, he never said that to me. He always used to say to me, Daddy, I'm not going to make it in prison. He's a charismatic, good-looking young boy in an adult prison, a target. But that meeting transformed him. At 22, he aced his GED, which is our high school certification in America. Self-taught himself at 94 percentile. It's like an A+. Plus. Uh, he's done some college studies in, in prison. He's back in, uh, by, besides becoming a plumber, he's going to get his uh, college degree. Uh, he's very well read. Uh, he's read the Torah, the Quran, the Bible. He wanted to know everything about Sufism. He's a bright kid. Um, so, so I think that that moment when we met uh, was very transformative. Uh, and I truly believe, you know, they sometimes they say when two or more people gather, spirit is with you, God is with you. And I, and, and I really feel that that was the moment that uh, there was this divine spirit. And I still believe that the divine spirit is an unseen hand that guides this work because really it is God's work when you come down to it. And um, so, you know, I obviously wasn't expecting all of the stuff uh, that has manifested in my life as a result of it. And it continues to manifest more and more and more so. Uh, so again, you know, it was the right choice for me. Forgiveness is hard. I know it's very hard for mortals. But uh, I think at some level, we all have to learn it. We all have to learn it. Tell me one thing. Uh did you have any reservations? I mean, I know that, you know, after you met Tony, you definitely felt very light. But right before that you would, you were about to meet Tony, did you have any reservations? Reservations about that, if I meet him, would there any emotion that would come on the surface that I don't want, or I thought that I have let it go? Maybe some resentment, or maybe the feeling of being wronged. Did you, or it went as per you thought? Yeah, I mean, I, I was nervous, but I have learned that uh, through my meditation practice, mm. that I never went to anger or hatred. Uh, I prayed for Tony. And, you know, most uh, scriptures will tell you, pray for your enemy. The Dalai Lama said, the enemy can teach you a lot. Yeah. 
Mandela said, you know, resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for your enemy to die. I teach this in my workshop that if you are angry at somebody or in resentment, and sometimes hatred, right? These are very powerful, debilitating emotions that preclude you from being fully present or being fully available to impact your life's mission to your fullest potential. Especially to pray for them. When you pray for them, that resentment, uh, that mm -hmm. anger uh, dissipates. So when I met him, I wasn't sure how I was going to react. Uh, because as mortals, that still plays in your head, you kill Tari. In fact, I obviously I led the way, all of my family have forgiven him. The only person that didn't forgive him was Jennifer, which was Tariq's uh, fiance. They'd been dating for two and a half years and got engaged and moved into the same apartment six weeks before he died. And she was actually quite angry with me. How can you forgive Tony? He killed Tariq. And my answer to her was, I'm gonna leave Tony to the higher power. I have my journey, he has his journey. And I'm not gonna go through life in anger and hatred and resentment, uh, or I'm not gonna go through life as a victim because there's no quality of life as a victim. I don't wanna go through life on crutches. And that, is an, and that is an important piece to share with your audience that Forgiveness is difficult unless you are able to separate yourself from the offender. Lead him to the higher power. Uh, it's a, a good story that uh, maybe um, explains this point well. I, one of my um, workshops on forgiveness, there was a Jewish lady. It's a two-day workshop, train the trainer. The online version is four days because you don't want to be sitting and looking at a computer for eight hours a day. So I've broken it into four, four hour segments. Well, this was a live presentation I did. I still remember the story. And she came up to me the morning of the second day. She says to me, Azim, you don't get it. She's very animated. And I say, well, what is it I don't get? I am working on forgiving Hitler pretty heavy. And I said to her, I understand, you know, uh, six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust, a big blemish on our history. And I understand her family was involved in, in, in some of this tragedy. Uh, but let me tell you something. And there's a lady that lives here in La Jolla, where I live in near San Diego who is a Holocaust survivor and has forgiven Hitler. But I told her, let me tell you something. I said, I see this anger and hatred in your aura. I see all of these lines of resentment because you've been, and Hitler died uh, 70 some years ago, 1945 or something. And I said, uh, she, she looked like she was in her uh, early, you know, late 50s, early 60s. I said, let me tell you something. The higher power is dealing with Hitler and knows how to deal with Hitler better than you do or I do. How is that working for you? Why do you want Hitler to live in this meager, important real estate of your psyche? Or don't you let it go knowing the higher power is dealing with it so love and joy can live there? And she kind of got it. You know, kind of a light bulb went on and even at the end of the second day, you could see those lines fading and you could see a different aura in her and a different light in her. And, and, and she had a huge breakthrough. Uh, as most of the people that attend this workshop uh, do have a, a breakthrough. Uh, and then about a, th a month later, I got this beautiful card from her. Uh, I've got a lot of letters and cards. This was very nicely. She put a lot of time in this card. And on the bottom, she wrote, P.S., my husband thanks you. We've been married for 35 years, yeah. and we now have the most lovely funny. relationship because Hitler doesn't live here. 
So that was my point to Jennifer, that uh, I'm gonna leave Tony to the higher power. Now she unfortunately was never able to forgive and seven years after Tariq died, uh, she got onto drugs, which is the unhealthy way to live on higher and higher and higher. And then seven years later, she overdosed on drugs and committed suicide. So that didn't turn out so well. I tried to work with her. I knew her quite well. Uh, while they were dating, they spent a lot of weekends. I traveled a lot, so they had a key to my home. Uh, so it, that, uh, I still feel, I wish she could have forgiven. She could have played a role in the foundation, uh, but that was not her journey. So, you know, I think that if people really get the power of forgiveness, I always said it was a selfish act, you do it for you. In one of my workshops, somebody corrected me and says, Azim, it's not a selfish act, it's a self-full act. <laughs> which is, uh, it's a healthy thing. And I, I mean, when I forgave, when I wrote my first book in 98, there wasn't much out there on forgiveness. You almost had to go through the scriptures. But today, uh, there are several clinical studies, probably over a hundred. There's a forgiveness project at Stanford. There is a forgiveness project in London. There is a, uh, there's several clinical studies that, uh, uh, you know, that show that forgiveness is a very healthy thing uh, to do for yourself. But when you spoke about Jennifer, what, because even I read up about her through your interviews only, and what I realized was that even she was grieving, it's when we spoke about grieving, she was just grieving perpetually. Uh, it's just that she was not able to handle the grief. Like you turned your pain into a purpose and and strive that you know more and more people get impacted but she just never stopped grieving and she couldn't know how to handle that and where to stop so there would be a lot of people like that who would be grieving what kind of message would you want to give to them like where should they know what is that differentiation line where they should realize you know what now it's getting too much i should really you know pull my horses back and just give it a thought that i'm going too much into it how do you differentiate that that's a good question. Um, I, I think you have to go back uh, uh, to, to the truth that God will never give you more pain than you can handle. And, and I think that if you are spiritually, we are all on a spiritual journey, uh, although we are at a different phases of our spiritual journey, and that part of the a hit that we get, and we all get hits, is to evolve us. But if you are on your spiritual journey, the question you must ask is not why me? Right. That's, a very, that's a very victim mentality. Yeah. The question you must ask is why did I attract this to me? You get a different answer, don't you? Uh, now, when I met the Dalai Lama for the first time in 2004, we were hosted by Pope John Paul. You might remember him. He died in 2005. We invited 30 people uh, to his uh, palace in Castel Gandolfo, which is near Rome. It's where his summer palace is. It's in the mountains. And we were tr treated by the same people that looked after the Pope. We were spoiled and treated like royalty. And I got very friendly to one of the monks because he travels with an entourage. And I got very close to one of the monks and, and he told me this. He says, you know, according to our Buddhist faith, we believe that everything that happens to us, we attract. And I told him, I said, I have a hard time with that because did I attract exactly. the murder of my son? Exactly. I said, no parent would ever do that. He says, before you were born and before your son was born, you had a contract because in every lifetime we have lessons to learn and sometimes it takes humans a thousand lifetimes to achieve nirvana or to achieve enlightenment and before you were born before he was born you had this contract that Tariq would come because one of your lessons in this lifetime was forgiveness and that he would die 
he chose it. He died in a very tragic manner because God gave us free will. You still had to choose between revenge and forgiveness. And you made the right choice. And because of that, you don't have to lose another son in your next life. Now, I recognize that this is a very evolved view. But the Lord works in mysterious ways. But the issue here, uh, the lesson here, is that you have to rely on your inner guidance. And, you know, it took me, 40 days wasn't enough. It took me a good three and a half years to stop grieving. I started the foundation nine months uh, after Tariq died. I wrote my first book in three years after he died. Uh, I, I did not date. I didn't have any social life. Uh, I was dating a girl before Tariq died and that relationship broke uh, on Monday. My father had a 12 hour surgery, seven bypasses on Thursday and Tariq died on Saturday, one week out of my life. I mean, any one of those three can throw you into a... Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a tough week. So it took me three and a half years. And, and I remember I met a girl um, in DC. I was on a speaking tour. Uh, and uh, um, after having given, I don't know, 10 speeches in six days or something. And I was still grieving. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm go this is my last speech. I got, I'm going home afterwards and I'm still grieving and I'm still very raw. And, and my speech finishes and my flight back home is two hours after I finished my speech. And the airport is an hour away. And a lot of people want to talk to me afterwards. Uh, after I speak, normally I get a big line and I want to, because everybody has a story. I said, if I stay here and talk to people, I'm not going to make my flight. She says, don't worry about it. I'll, as soon as you finish, I'll be on stage. I'll pull you through the crowd and I'll have a, 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 a car waiting for you to take you to the airport. And sure enough, she wasn't very tall, but she was feisty and she got me through, I don't know, six, seven hundred people in the audience. And as I got into the limousine, she handed me a note and uh, said, uh, thank you and you know, have a safe trip home. And then I read the note, basically said, uh, if you ever back in Washington, please call me. I'd love to show you around and see you again. And I thought to myself, she likes me, you know? So anyway, we ended dating. Uh, and about three and a half years later, uh, after Tariq died, I was in DC. Uh, and we were out with some of her friends and I cracked a joke and we all laughed. And I went like this and she said to me, are you okay? I said, I said yeah, I'm fine. I'm having a good time. She said, well, why did you go like this? I said, you know what? I haven't laughed for three and a half years. It felt strange to laugh and I knew the clouds had finally parted. So you have to follow your inner guidance and do the work, uh, do the healthy way to grieve. And sure enough, the clouds will part and you'll know that it is now time to transform that grief into something more positive. Because essentially grieving is energy and that energy can be transformed. And I was able to, as you pointed out, uh, find purpose in my tragedy. And, uh, and sometimes that can happen, you know, and that's the gift that, uh, uh, that my son gave me. My, my life's mission was not to be in international finance, but do the work that I'm doing with the kids in the foundation, teaching forgiveness and doing interviews like this. That's my life's purpose. And when you are on your life's purpose, I would say it's like having a perpetual tailwind and the road rises to meet you because the universe supports you. Because, you know, when you're on your purpose, uh, God is your partner. Yeah. And what's not possible with a partner like that? 
But then through that, Mr. Kamisa, what I realized is that, you know, for you, and I've told you this in our previous conversation as well, I just feel that uh, somewhere it was a very handheld thing in the sense that God was just preparing you that, you know, when this occasion comes and you rise up to it. You had a very strong backing in terms of your spirituality. You were already inclined towards those things. Now, when we talk about forgiveness, I mean, uh, I can understand that because even I resonate with a lot of what you say. But I'm sure that when you're talking to school kids, when we are talking to students who might have come from backgrounds that are very difficult to uh, you know, understand. You told me once that there was this one girl who was in the foster care, right? We, we really cannot be sure that what kind of spirituality or what kind of faith they are coming up with. To them, how do, we, how do you explain this to them then? Like, how do you, uh, you know, mold them in a way that they understand forgiveness and they also practice it? Because this comes from, you know, a lot of faith in the higher power and the surrender, uh, you know, letting go of your ego. How do you tell this to an eight-year-old kid? And how do you mold them that they understand? I mean, I, I just feel that when you would be doing this in school, this is just commendable. How do you do that? Well, um, you know, the best way to teach is by example. Absolutely. Kids have a good BS radar. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. They can see BS. Yeah. So when we are introduced, because when we're on a live assembly, we are introduced, this man's grandson killed this man's son. And here they are in the spirit of compassion, of empathy, of forgiveness, and of brotherhood. He's African-American. My roots are more, more like yours, Eastern. Um, he's Christian and Muslim. His kid killed my son, and we're brothers. It's a very powerful image. So I, sh I shared with you the story um, about uh, Vanessa, about the eight-year-old uh, that was in the foster care system. So I won't repeat that story. But uh, one of the students, uh, her name is Rocio. Uh, she was uh, beaten really badly by a youth gang. She lived four blocks away from our school when she was in seventh grade. So she was about 13 years old. Um, so there's a gang waiting in the bushes and the initiation was whoever the next person crosses the street, you gotta go beat her up or beat him up. What well, happened to be her. So they really beat her up, pulled her hair, she's bleeding. Fortunately, there was an adult there. So he was able to intervene and she ran home. Uh, about four days later, the foundation brought our, what we call the peacemaker assembly to their school. And she was in the audience. And she saw that I was in, we were introduced, this man's grandson killed this man's son. And here they are in the spirit of forgiveness and brotherhood that really impacted her. She forgave her, her, her attackers, went through high school, went through Berkeley, got a degree in social work and is now one of our top facilitators in the foundation. So the best way to teach is through example. Please, by example, absolutely. Yeah. And, the, and the same thing happened to Vanessa that was able to forgive her biological mother and, and now a senior at Bishops, which is a very Ivy League school uh, and forgive the world. Uh, so, plus I have over a hundred, maybe 150,000 letters from kids and some of them come with images. Uh, there's one on my wall that I really like, uh, came with, you know, crayons and everything. And it was written by a seventh grader, said the ultimate expression of love is forgiveness. This was by a seventh grader. Wow. Written by seventh grader. So to answer your question, not only are these concepts teachable, I believe our children are hungry for them because they don't see many examples like this. That's true. That's true. But then I mean, I, had a, I, I, mean, I give you another example. I spoke uh, at SDSU, uh, which is one of, our, one of our colleges in San Diego. 
And this uh, recent graduate came up to me, African American, and said to me, Mr. Kamisa, you changed my life. And I said, tell me more. He said, when I was in sixth grade, you came and spoke to my school. I've just graduated with a degree in finance and have a job with Wells Fargo. And I wouldn't be here because after I heard you speak, I decided to make you my role model. I know you are an investment banker. Um, and I did not follow my brother or my father or my grandfather who were all gang involved. His children will not be gang involved. So you don't really know who you touch, but, but uh, uh, there are many stories like that. In fact, and I heard in your test also that some a very big percentage of drops in these, uh, you know, in gang violence or these uh, such cases in the school. I think you were talking about somewhere close to more than seventy percent drops in the cases like that, right? Which your yeah. foundation has been able to achieve, which is again, I would say, I mean, this is commendable. Not even yeah. the government can do that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I think that uh, that we've uh, created a solution to this, uh, through our safe school model. The assembly is just one of our programs. We now have five programs. We have a 10 week curriculum, which follows the assembly. Uh, we have three levels of it, fifth, sixth grade, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, because we specialize in this middle years, fifth mm -hmm. to 10th grade. And Tony joined a gang in sixth grade and took my son's life in eighth grade. It's a tough time for our adolescents. Um, and then we have a peace club we create on campus, which is, and we teach classes on empathy and compassion, forgiveness, accountability, peace building. How do you resolve conflict without violence? Uh, all stuff is teachable. And then we create a peace club, which is essentially 60 titles of what it takes to be a leader, a known violent leader that is committed to peace building in their schools, in their homes, and in their community. And then we have a mentoring program for the tough kids that are essentially potentially going to be the Tonys. And now we have a parenting piece, which we've developed in partnership with Berkeley University. Uh, and, and we have made it affordable. I mean, in California, uh, free public, you know, K through 12 is free public education. The cost of the taxpayer is around $11,435. The cost of incarceration for youth for one year is 148000 over $400 a day. And even after that, the recidivism rate is 84%, as measured over the last five years. The safe school model is $100 a kid a year. It's affordable. Although, although we don't get funded by the education system, so I spend as much time raising money for the foundation because a lot of the schools we go to don't have money for it. So we bring our programs for free. But I hope that someday the Department of Education will make this mainstream because think about it, only 30% of America have graduate degrees. So not every kid is going to end up with a degree or an astronaut or a doctor or a lawyer or or, or uh, but they're all going to be parents. So this stuff we are teaching is really as important as learning English, science, and math. That is because the problem. No, we, we focus so much on academics. We don't teach them the basis of living the life. I mean, not not everyone is going to be that speaker on the stage, or you know, is going to explore a planet in, in the universe. But everyone will have. You know, struggles in their life and no one teaches us the schools don't give you that foundation to deal with the crisis and to tell you yes. that life is going to throw shit at you it's totally up to you whether you want to react or whether you want to respond and that's what that's i think true. your school model is able to do to teach yeah. kids how to respond and not to react right, right. But absolutely no. i think in your case mr kamiza uh, i can see you know it's it's like it's a beautiful and a very compelling story in terms of that the closure has been achieved and when i say that i say because there were three things happening at the same time you were already on your journey of forgiveness right the justice the legal system was on your side they wanted to punish the perpetrator 
and tony was also on his journey to realize something that he did wrong so it come across as something that you know it has been completed right but i want to know that had tony not realized that what he did was wrong would you still have been able to forgive tony would the story still have been the same no well actually he didn't uh the i forgave him pretty much soon after the tragedy reached out to the grandfather nine months yeah. uh, the two years while he was uh, uh waiting for his trial he was in gravado uh he uh, thought uh, everybody was stupid his grandfather was too strict the da was stupid the pizza delivery man was stupid uh he was pointing fingers he was actually born to a 15 year old uh and his father never had uh, uh his father never was in his life so he shunned him every time he met him so i forgave tony a long time before he asked for my forgiveness and when he was tried the day before he was tried plus mike reynolds had met him 21 times uh his grandfather and he had a very cathartic uh, conversation because his public defender that defended him said to the grandfather tony doesn't realize what's coming to him tomorrow is his hearing and that hearing was about whether he should be tried as an adult or as a juvenile and he gave a very remorseful speech 16 years old where he says i shot and killed tari kamisa a person i did not know who was not doing anything wrong to me so he finally woke up um i i wish Mr Kamisa would forgive me for the pain that I have caused him. We used the talk that he gave uh in our programs. Uh, I'd already forgiven him, but that's when he asked for it. So to answer your question. Now this is a hypothesis. I don't know this for sure. But if your forgiveness is altruistic, has no strings attached to it. if you say i only forgive you because you ask for my forgiveness that's not sincere that's not altruistic there's a string attached to it it's not authentic i truly believe if your forgiveness has no strings attached to it it will shift the other person maybe not immediately but in time and if it doesn't you have to challenge the quality of your forgiveness basically you only have to work on yourself you have to make yourself to that level that you know you are able to forgive yeah, without because, anything expecting in return yeah because then it will shift that other person right. so in the story i mean really like like when i heard you and when i heard uh, you know you talking about tony what i realized is that realization especially tony's realization would be contributing a lot for the other kids that because he can be there and he can tell them that what he has been through and how your forgiveness actually saved him and can actually now save a lot of other kids right uh when i look at it like that that actually takes me back to this age long held wisdom and belief when we say that you know there's there's no right deed and there is no wrong deed it's not even the intention i think it's the realization if i haven't realized that what i'm doing is wrong if i haven't realized the intensity of what i'm doing is wrong how would i ever i know if this that this is what i did is you know has caused so much of damage or pain to someone right so does your program or the way you teach uh, you know uh, and imbibe this quality of forgiveness how much of emphasis do you also place on the realization part Yeah I mean I I think that uh you find that it's not so much that the curriculum it's more the energy that is part of the curriculum that uh communication is you know the spoken word is a very small part of a communication Uh, the body language uh, the actual energy and how you how you actually communicate uh is much more powerful and and if you teach by example 
I mean, people can look at me. I mean, I get told a lot of time, you seem to be so peaceful. <laughs> you know, I don't talk about being peaceful, but that energy tr translates. But the main thing is uh, the authenticity of our message. We talked about it a little earlier, that if you're like this to kids, yeah. or if you are BSing kids, yeah. or if you're being authentic, I never talk down to kids, I talk with them, you know. I tell them this is how I felt, this was my journey, and this worked for me. But I think what communicates through that whole presentation is authenticity of the message and the energy that exudes. And when they see me and the grandfather together, they actually feel the love between the two of us. Don't talk about it. We sit next to each other and you can tell that we genuinely love That's and genuine. respect I each other. Yeah, I mean, you can see it. Yeah. But that, I think, is what kids need to see, is more authenticity, which they don't see. A lot of it's this. We have a very punitive mindset, uh, not a restorative mindset. And I think that what we are teaching, obviously we have the curriculum, we have the lessons, we have all of that. But the power of all of that is in the delivery and the authenticity of our mentors. You know, we spent 60 hours training them. Uh, and many of them have traveled the journey. Like I just told you about Rocio, right? I mean, they're street smart. Uh, and they have gotten the message. They've gotten the lesson. And, and, and now not only are they, are they espousing it, uh, it's become part of their DNA. And that ability for them to then transfer that, you know, comes through. Does that, does that answer your question? Yes, 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 absolutely. But uh, in this whole scene of forgiveness, then, me seeking justice, then isn't it a very futile exercise? And why am I talking about it? Because I'm coming to restorative justice theory here. But uh, because if it's all between me and the other person, then where would you place the law and order and justice part in when no, you talk about a broader society? Right. So the let's talk about that because that's a good question. Uh, the problem with our justice system is broken definitely broken in America. Uh, it needs a tremendous uh, uh, reform. Now, if you look at the Western world, and I think also if you look at the Indian subcontinent, um, which was also colonized. Um, I grew up in Kenya, my roots are back uh, where your roots are in, 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 in India. Uh, under the colonial system, most of the criminal code came from uh, monarchy because a lot of the European uh, pilgrims that first came to America are, are, are Europeans. And in, and in a monarchy, the king or the queen owns both the land and the people. So when there's a crime committed, it's always the king or the queen against the offender. We don't have monarchy in, uh, in, in the US, neither do you have it in India. So the state takes that rule. Role. So in the case of my tragedy, it was the state of California against Tony Hicks. Now, I've written a lot about restorative justice in my books, which comes out of the Aboriginal cultures of Australia and New Zealand. That's interesting because their criminal code is a lot more humane and evolved than ours. And yet when you meet them, they talk like this is how they talk. It's a tribal. So what they believe is that crime happens in the context of community. Right. What is the king or the queen or the state going to do with it? In a crime, there are three parties. There's the victim, there's the offender, and then there's community. And justice is not done till three things happen. First, you've got to make the victim whole. But you can't bring Tariq back. But working with Tony and his grandfather, less kids are ending up in prison or ending up dead. It's meaningful to my family and me. 
So to the extent that I can be restored, I believe I have been. The second piece is you're going to take the offender and bring him back into society as a contributing and functioning member, which we've done with Tony. Right. And the third thing is you have to heal the community. And us working in schools, doing the work I'm doing in my workshops, doing interviews like this, they're helping community. Yeah. So it's a win, win, win. And, uh, you know, when a, when a youth offends in the Aboriginal cultures, the whole village comes out, puts the youth in the middle of the circle and say something positive about his character and inspires him to make amends with the victim. They don't throw the offender away like we do. They believe when the offender, when a youth that offends is closely connected to community, is less likely to re-offend. Whereas in our system, we put them away and they come out better criminals than when they went in. Yeah. This is, it's the same kind of treatment to almost all varieties of criminals, right? There is no division, there's no distinction. That has someone actually uh, you know, done that, like you said, because they have themselves been a victim of the community and the society, or was it actually a very deliberate action from their end? Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, you have to give them a second chance. We've all, you know, we've all done wrong things. We've all harmed. Maybe we haven't killed anybody, but we've all harmed at some level. Sometimes you harm people that are closest to us. But, but, in, this, but in this system, Mr. Kamiza, don't you think that, uh, see, again, I would say that with you, because you had such a strong faith and foundation that it was, I would say that uh, you learned to actually adapt to that system. But for someone who's already grieving the loss for someone very close, in that context, we expect or we want that person to understand that, you know, this criminal or this, this person, he, him, or he or she himself has been a victim of the society and work with that person to bring him back into society. It's like a double whammy. So that, don't you think that actually takes even, even more from that person who's already grieving? But let me assure you, uh, uh, I am an ordinary person. I always say I'm an investment banker, so I have a PhD in greed and avarice. <laughs> <laughs> I am not a cleric. Uh, I am not a minister. Uh, I, I, I'm not trained in divinity. Uh, sometimes we think forgiveness is the purview of saints. Trust me, I'm not a saint. I'm just an ordinary <laughs> working person like yourself you know so i think it's possible for all of us uh, sure enough uh, i grew up in a very in a family my mom was very spiritual my dad was a businessman so i grew up with equal emphasis on my career and my spiritual life if i'm reading a business book i'm also reading a spiritual book uh, but i think we all have some form of spirituality of course india is very spiritual uh, I love India. I've been there many times. Uh, and I think that that awakening is important. And uh, when uh, offenders offend, they are not awakened yet. Realization again, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I think that part of society's uh, mission is to help them awake. And they can be awoken. Tony was awoken. Yeah. But he had to have some kind of an example. Yeah. Some kind of a mentor. Some kind of an interaction. Because, I, you know, I mean, most of us are good people. And I think most of us have some exposure to religion, spirituality, the scriptures. Um, the key is to understand that we are here to serve. There's a great quote by Albert Schweitzer. He says, I don't know what your destiny will be, but what I do know, those of you who will find happiness will find it in service. Another great quote from a great Indian philosopher, Tagore, I'm sure you've heard of Tagore. I love him. He says, I dreamt life was joy 
I woke up and I found out life was service. I acted and behold, service is joy. So the point I'm trying to make is uh, you don't want to get lost in the materialistic world, the me, 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 me world. We're here to serve. And I think true happiness comes to that ability to serve. And to that extent, I, and I'm thankful to my son and the good Lord that put me on my life's purpose because it has brought me happiness, it's brought me peace, it has brought me good health. And, uh, and, and I love this work. Uh, and, I, and I feel fortunate uh, that the Lord picked me to do this work. I mean, investment banking was about money. This is about saving lives of children. What is more meaningful? I think one awakening led to another. You got enlightened in the awakening and that led to Tony being, uh, you know, awakened to what he can be. And I'm sure that would actually create a legacy of more and more students opting for non-violence and peace and compassion and forgiveness. And I just wonder, I mean, the coming times are going to be very exciting for, uh, for your foundation and I'm sure for all the kids. Uh, but Mr. Kaniza, tell me one more thing. Uh, it's been 25 years, right? And I know that you have forgiven Tony, but I mean, I really, I feel that, you know, we all have our vulnerable and weak moments wherein we, you know, those moments when we do not want to put up this facade, facade even to ourselves that, you know, yes, I'm strong and I don't want to live like a victim. There are moments when we just want to break apart and we just want to blame. We just want to blame because that's how we feel that, you know, yes, I feel lighter. Uh, Hasn't there been any moment in past 25 years where you really felt that resentment or even if it has been, how, how did you cope up with it? Like, that's, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as a mortal, we all go through it. I always say that uh, my meditation practice today is two hours a day. It used to be an hour. Uh, but, you know, when you meet somebody... Uh, like the Dalai Lama, he'll tell you that uh, uh, that every emotion has a frequency. Some emotions are very low frequencies. Some emotions are very high frequencies. So greed and avarice, judgment is one of those. Anger, resentment, hatred. Uh, these are very low vibratory emotions where happiness doesn't reside there. And then we have this high vibratory emotions of goodwill, friendship, trust, empathy, compassion, gratitude, forgiveness is right there with love. Now, when you meet him, he's living in this high vibratory emotions 24 seven. Yeah. Us mortals all have a bad hair day, as you pointed out, and you get angry. Yeah. I do too, and you fall off the wagon. And now, you are no longer vibrating here, which are vibrating down there. Exactly. So when that happens to me, which it does, you get angry or like you mentioned, you get into these places. I add another half an hour to my two hour meditation and get back up here. Get it. I get it. Stay in Basically. prayer. Yeah, stay in prayer. Well, I can tell you this, having done this work for 25 years, I'm spending more time here. And when I'm up here, I'm in the flow. I'm happier, I'm more peaceful, I'm healthier. And this is not difficult for anybody to understand at any given moment in time, where are you vibrating? Up here or down there? And I'm sure more spiritually still connected with that ego. I mean, spiritually, definitely, you can always be connected with Tariq. And I think when you're vibrating here, it's always a more closer connection with him, right? Yeah. And I'm sure he would be very happy. My last question to you, and I, I have taken all the time because there were a lot of questions, is uh, when, and because I had a conversation with you last week, I had seen your interviews, but when you talk to someone in person and you get to know a lot better about them, and I can actually say that while talking to you, you know, you do sound and you come across that, you know, this person has really invested a lot of time in his own peace. I'm not talking about other people's forgiveness. Yes, forgiveness actually gets you to peace. But, you know, you have invested a lot of time 
in yourself in understanding yourself in getting to that space where you were calm where you are like you said you know vibrating here with all love happiness and forgiveness and you live life you sound full of it it's not that yes something really bad happened and you have moved on for higher good but you also seem to be in love with life now you have turned that you know love into what is uh, in service of other people and that's why you look even more fuller but there are a lot of people when something bad happens to them they get trapped in it if i may say so even that same thing happened to jennifer like these people trap themselves and they're not able to move out and even if they feel a moment of happiness like you said that in your three and a half years you never laugh they feel guilty that you know i don't have any right to be happy what would you want to say to them your last message what would you say for to people who are trying to move on or who want to feel happy but they feel that you know they are not they don't have the right yeah so that discussion is about self forgiveness so in my workshop i spent uh, three milestones of how you forgive people that have harmed you and three milestones of how you forgive yourselves which is harder to do by the way to look at your own stuff and i had to i had to you can you know one of my in my trilogy the first was motive to forgiveness and forgiveness to fulfillment because i've been very fulfilled with the work that i have done and and then fulfillment to peace was the trilogy and tony actually wrote the forward to it but that book was ready uh, for a long time set on my shelves because i kept getting in meditation the book isn't ready and for about 6 months or 8 months i kept asking the universe why isn't it ready and finally about 8 months later i got the download that it it lacks a chapter on self forgiveness i thought oh i should have known that but you can't get to peace for giving people that have hurt you you got to look at your own stuff and i had to do that and do right the wrongs and and the steps i teach on self forgiveness is a take responsibility for your actions a lot of time we are blaming everybody else ask forgiveness of the people you harmed whether it's granted or not is not the issue but you have to ask change your behavior forever and help another person not follow in your former footsteps so i do some work in prisons i work at three federal prisons uh leavenworth which is the oldest one by kansas city um i learned which is by detroit and petersburg which is by richmond and there's a program called lcp life connection program which is led by the chaplain So it's a spiritual program. So every inmate has a spiritual teacher or a spiritual advisor. So if you are a Christian, you have a minister. If you are a Muslim, you have an imam. If you are Jewish, you have a rabbi. If you are a Hindu or Buddhist, you have a monk. And if you're none of that, you have a, a, a holistic uh, spiritual advisor. Uh, and you're supported through this. course i will speak at the front end of it because uh, the chaplain always says once they listen to you they pay attention to the rest of the curriculum them right in the adult system is 2/3 if they go through the lcp program it's under 17% which is huge very difficult to change your behavior i drink too much caffeine <laughs> you have to start change in that behavior is hard for me and you to change so when you get to these people that are uh uh you know in this throes of where they are not inspired as i said they're not awakened uh if the question here is self forgiveness and i think that that uh, in itself is uh important for all of us to do and uh having done this work for 25 years forgiving others that have harmed you and forgiving yourselves are actually the flip side of the same coin as you do one you get better at the other one the steps are different but they do converge much like your railway tracks and uh um uh, and that uh, conversation 
is essentially uh, going to happen uh, when you are awoke, when when you are awakened. You know, when you meet somebody, or you go through a, a workshop like mine, or you read something, or you listen to something, uh, you see. You see that the path you are on uh, is destructive to yourself. Jennifer is a good example. She never was awoken, and maybe that was uh, something that will happen to her in her next lifetime. So you still have to have the empathy and compassion for those. If you are, and, and I think the universe and uh, 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 continuously is prodding you to put you on your spiritual path. It doesn't, it doesn't give up on you. It's continuously giving you hints. If you are not on your path and your life isn't working and, 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 and prodding you. And, and, and that when you do awaken, you see the light and see that your path is not your life mission is. And you start taking responsibility for your action, ask forgiveness to people, change your behavior, and then help others. You get on a really different path. That actually gave me my aha moment right now that if the universe doesn't give up on you, then how can you give up on yourself and other people, right? When it still keeps on nagging you to just get on the track and do the work. And how can uh, you? I mean, you're just a part of it, right? So it's, uh, it's even, it's, it's your duty to be in support with that and do the work, right? Yeah. And and follow your inner, yeah, and follow your inner guidance. We all have that. Absolutely. But yeah, again, for that, you know, you really need to be attuned to your higher self or your deeper self. I think uh, your, what, whatever your faith is, I think spirituality is something that can really help you be afloat in the toughest of times. And it's, I think each one, I, we should have. And like you say, I don't know, why don't they teach this in schools? It is so important. It's so basic. These are the things that make you survive in life. And I think when you can survive in life, then you can do, you can do anything and you can achieve anything. That's so absolutely. Spirituality, forgiveness, compassion, these, these should be the values and these should be the foundation on which, you know, the future should be built on. Yeah, and I think, get it wrong. right. And I think our children are hungry for those. Because, because they don't get to see it. True. Yeah. True. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kamiza. It was, Again, I mean, I had a very long conversation with you last week as well. I've had a very long conversation with you uh, here as well. But I think the more I talk to you, you know, the, uh, there's so much that just opens up, like the perspective gets widened. And like you say, you really live, you know, you teach people by example. And I'm sure when I look up at you and it's, it's you feel proud, though it's, it's all the work has been done by you, but I'm sure that other people who look at your story and who talk to you, we feel proud to have someone among us who's been able to do that and give us that faith that, you know what, the world is not all lost and you can yeah. still get back and do the work, right? And it's, I don't know, it's, it's, just a, it's just pleasure talking to you. That's what all I can say. It has been an yeah. immense, immense, pleasant experience talking to you and thank you so much for your time thank you well, let me acknowledge you too because uh, likewise this has been a pleasure i've been interviewed a lot and you have asked some very deep questions and uh you it's it's been a wonderful experience for me as well because sometimes when you teach is when you learn and uh and so you know, you've given me a gift back in my own evolution. So thank you again for inviting me to your, uh, to your interview. And I, I, I'm sure that I will be pestering you again for my season twos and season threes. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I want in the last you to share with people how can they reach out to you and where they can find more about Tari Kamisa Foundation and how can they donate if they want to. Yes, certainly. We have a very robust website. The Tari Kamisa Foundation is uh, tkf.org. Maybe you can. I'll put the link. Yes. Yeah. And um, share the TED Talk, which is easy to do, which you've seen. 
And my personal website is my name, azimkamisa.com. Uh, I have written several books which are available uh, on Amazon. Um, and uh, then, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of emails and they're welcome to email me. Um, azim Any at tkf.org yeah. or azim at azimkamisa.com. Those are good emails. Um, and he does reply, that's what I want to say because that's how I reached out to him. And he does reply to the mails. So again? <laughs> I'm saying, and you do reply to the mails because that's how I reached out to you. So yes, right. if someone wants to reach out yeah, to you. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 the best way to communicate with me is by email because yeah. I do, I do respond to email, and I you know you get a lot of time differences, and with email it uh, goes the way you respond when you can. But I am very responsive on emails, and um, yeah, sure. I mean, we'd love to. Uh, have some people donate. I'm doing an online workshop at the end of September. It's uh, four hours uh, for four days from September 29th to October 2nd, Tuesday through Friday from nine to one. And you can get those details on my website as well as uh, uh, on social media. And uh, those of you who want to learn forgiveness of yourselves or of others, this is a very good workshop, yes. yeah. especially if you're working with uh, victims and a lot of the Social people workers. that go to my workshops are MDs and therapists and psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers and uh, victim service providers. Um, so it's a very deep dive, it's 16 hours and uh, most everybody gets a breakthrough. So tons of resources so yes. no yes. no excuses not to be on this journey <laughs> absolutely i think you have actually prepared the foundation that you know i would not let you have even the smallest excuse to get out of it so that's amazing and like i said last week as well i again want to take that opportunity to say that i think sari wherever he is i think he'll be very proud of you you've created a legacy and i'm sure this would be carried forward by people that you've touched upon and I'm sure that you know they will take it forward and like I said I think uh, we're really looking forward to the most exciting times especially when it comes to the kind of work that you're doing and all the amazing things that you've done so well, thank, thank you thank you Mr. Kamisa